We've been laying a foundation for 1 Timothy and our understanding of the book. We have begun our study of this letter. Paul is concerned about uh, false teaching that is coming into the churches in Ephesus, and so he is warning Timothy. He's encouraging Timothy to pray. He's telling Timothy, don't give up, persevere. God is great. He's going to do great things in and through us. And he's continuing to work through the implications of what that looked like in the church. So in this section, we're ready to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. But before we do that, let me again give you a situation to help us begin to think about this section. I love my wife, Trudy, and the fact that she's been able to be here these last couple of days for the recording is a special pleasure to me. I think that my wife is beautiful. She is attractive. She works hard, and she is a lovely woman. I go back to growing up and watching her grow. Now, Trudy and I are a number of years apart. I am older than she is. So she was just a little girl when I was a boy in middle school. And then when I graduated from high school, she was just um, still in middle school. But when I really began to notice her, because our, our two families knew each other, had a relationship with each other. But when I began to notice Trudy was when I came back from seminary, I had come home on, on winter break and I went to a basketball tournament and she happened to be there. She was the cheerleader for her high school team and, and something about her caught my attention. It says, oh, that's an attractive young lady and I know who that is. I know her family and well, I just noticed her and a couple of days later we went snow skiing in some hills not too far from where we live and she was there again and so I, again I noticed her and I said, ah, she's an attractive young lady. Oh, but we're several years apart, you know, she, she wouldn't be interested in me. And some time went by and uh, she graduated from high school and I decided one time that I would ask her out on a date. So I called her and I was very nervous. Uh, Trudy, what, do you think you and I could go out maybe and have some pizza or go to a movie? And she said, I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I can't. I'm actually dating someone else. And I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. And oh, it took me so much courage to work up the energy to talk to her the first time anyway. But time went by and a year later, I found out that she was no longer dating anyone. So I called her and I said, would you like to go out on a date with me? And she said, yes, I would. So I was very excited and that she's a very attractive young lady. And we went out on this date and we went out for we got something to eat and, and we went to a movie and we talked and talked and the more we talked, I noticed something about her. All she ever did was talk about herself. I was like, um, I'd, I'd like to talk about myself a little bit too. And it wasn't in a mean way. She was very pleasant and very nice and everything. But I go, ah, she, she has some growing up to do yet, you know, as I did as well. But we, we dated for a short time and then we decided not to date and I was farming by that time and, and she was off to college and university and then she worked in a ministry called Campus Crusade and a number of years later we met again. And so we talked and there was something very different about her. She had grown and her character had grown deeper and richer and she had really come, uh, she had been a Christian for many years but she really came to the place where she loved her relationship with the Lord and she was growing in it and, and it was dynamic and exciting. And th the interesting thing about Trudy and I and our different faith journey is that I went to a Bible college and a Bible seminary and she went to a regular university. And I came to learn many things in my head about Christianity and about the Bible, but I longed to have a passion to share my faith with other people. Trudy was completely the opposite. She was sharing her faith. She was engaged in ministry, and yet she was in a secular university. So she longed for the kind of education about God's Word that I had had. So it was interesting that we were looking for something that was true in the other person. Well, when we began to date again, she was still, a, I would say she was an even more beautiful young woman at the time, but I noticed something more than her outward beauty that she had an inner beauty in her heart that had grown rich over the years. That the years that we had not been dating, God had really been working in her heart. And I noticed something in myself that while I was attracted to what I saw with my eyes, 
there was something in my heart that was attracted to her heart because there was a depth and there was a character. And that's so important because what's happening in our culture, I see it in America, I see it when I come to your country here, we are fixated, we are enamored with external beauty, the shape of our bodies, the, the style of our hair, the type of our clothes. Uh, everything is about looking good. The magazines and the movies are all about external beauty. But God would say, you know, it, it's wonderful that I have given you beauty, but he says, what I'm concerned about is the beauty of the heart. And so when Paul writes this section to Timothy, he shifts from men, which is where we left off last time. He says, men, I want you to pray. I want you to take the initiative. I want you to be responsible in your homes and in your churches to pray, to lift up holy hands before God. But what about the women? What is the role of women in the church? What is their participation in the worship service? And they say, oh, Pastor Bruce, this is a matter of great debate and discussion in our church or in our denomination. Are you going to try to answer all of those questions? Uh, no, I'm not. But you see, what we've been trying to tell you is we built a deep foundation underneath this letter. We understand the situation that was going on in Ephesus and in their churches and the false teaching that was coming in and the dangers associated with that. So when we come to this section and Paul is talking about what proper conduct of worship in a church is like, he said, men, this is what I expect of you. Women, now let me talk to you about what um, adoration and appropriate worship is like for women in the church. What would that look like in this context, in this culture, and what principles can be extrapolated for us in our culture today? Because again, the people of their city and their culture were worshiping in this great temple to the goddess Diana. It was huge. It had all these marble pillars. It was this fantastic place, but they weren't worshiping God. They were worshiping this goddess of beauty and fertility and all of the lusts and passions that went along with it. So out of this corrupted culture, God was identifying people that he called and made part of his family who, were, who became Christians. But when we become Christians, we say, well, how is how I'm supposed to live now different than what my culture around me is saying? We talk about belief driving behavior. So the fact that I am a man or the fact that I am a woman and now I have come to Christ, does that have any impact on how I dress, on how I worship, on how I live, on how I am, am impacted in my family? Yes, it does. And that's what Paul is going to share with women in chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, verses 9 through 15. So let me read those verses with you. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. Here's what he writes. Likewise also the women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So Paul is writing this in a culture which is saying, hey, let's emphasize how physically beautiful we are. The Olympic Games and the men that would run in those games and their physical prowess and their physical beauty and the women with all their adornments. What does it mean to be a Christian woman in worship in the first century with principles that cross over into our lives today? That's what we're going to find out in this section. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.